live and pre-recorded. This is the Red Ticket Blues Podcast. I am Brian Buckley. This is being recorded on October 4th to hit the internet on October 5th. How's everybody doing? You can always listen to the show on iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, YouTube, and follow me at BrianBuck13 or follow the show at Red Ticket Blues or follow both. Uh, Today is the Thursday talk. If you're new to the show, I do a podcast mainly about sports, throwing a little uh, culture and, uh, you know, everyday life sort of junk, um, for lack of a better term. Uh, If you're new on Tuesdays, I usually do a we're a little around the world with sports, giving my takes, and they are hot takes abound. Thursdays, we like to have a guest on called Thursday Talk. And this week, we have Phil Mushnick of the New York Post. He was nice enough to join us. We went over a lot of things. Uh, network TV, took in a little, you know, fans going to the games. What I mean by that is being outpriced from the games. A little fan duel, WWE, WFAN, Mike Francesa, of course. So I hope everyone enjoys it. I'm rambling at this point. You want to hear Phil Mushnick talk, not me. So here he is. So as promised, our special guest on the podcast, Phil Mushnick, a sports media columnist for the New York Post. Uh, You can read his column Equal Time, which is published on Sundays, Mondays, and Fridays. Phil, welcome to the Red Ticket Blues podcast. Thank you, Brian. Let's be honest now. This is take two. This is take two. (laughs) Absolutely. There was a little recording issue. Uh, (laughs) You your audience should know that we completed, what, five five hours? And it's all we got to do it again. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Brian. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so, like I already asked you, uh, do you miss Tom Brady? <laughs> do, do you miss Tom Brady? Hey, let me ask you, do you miss Harold Reynolds and Tom Verducci yet? <laughs> no, that was Brian's first no. question. I said, not particularly, but, uh, you know, they didn't kill it for me. Uh, you know, the, the, I don't understand... Network executives who have turned uh, television into radio or back to radio, whatever. It's a visual medium, and yet they just fill our ears and they they, uh, give us a lot of stuff to read. And uh, it's still a visual medium. Let us watch the game. Uh, It's not just Fox. It's certainly not. I mean, ESPN is worse than Fox. Uh, the idea that we, we've actually we tune in. Uh, Chris Collinsworth, another guy who used to be terrific when he said as little as possible. Now it's he, he feels as if we've tuned in to, to listen to him uh, talk about football. Uh, before I realized we weren't recording, you were just about to get into a thought of the media in the town of New York and Carmelo Anthony. Mm. You want to finish that thought? Yeah, well, I was saying... Uh, uh, that uh, we still have basketball and, and, and uh, lots of hockey in front of us, but uh, in this town, New York, uh, the media has this uh, uh, sense that everyone who, who enjoys basketball loves Carmelo Anthony, and I don't see any evidence of that. I, you know, I've never, I've never been in a group of people or even one on one with anyone telling me, "Hey, how about that Carmelo Anthony?" Quite the contrary, I said. Boy, instead we hear he's he's ruined it. He's he's ruined the Knicks. He's the latest uh, Dolan acquisition to to ruin the Knicks. In fact, uh, I've been reading lately how um, the New York the Knicks uh, are, are very um, thoroughly renowned free agents are not eager to sign with the Knicks as if they don't want to play in New York. I don't think that's it at all. I think if you're a uh, a, a talented basketball player, professional basketball player, you don't want to go on a team where it's a given that you're going to have to subjugate your skill to get the ball to a single player. No, and, uh, I, 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 think, I agree completely. I mean, I, I think that the majority of people don't – a majority of basketball fans in New York don't like Carmelo Anthony. I think the ones that really do enjoy him are so into it and so devoted to him that maybe it seems like there are more people that actually support him. But I don't know how you can actually like a guy like Carmelo Anthony if you like a team game. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, I don't I don't know Carmelo Anthony, so I guess I could like him because I don't know him. But I, right, on a sports what I, level. What I see of his game, I can't stand it. Right. I can't stand it. He... It, 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 he inspires loitering. You know, you get him the ball, you stand around, you let him deal. We'll talk about a little bit more about the World Series and uh, some other topics, but let's quickly right. learn a little about you. You started at the Post in 1973 as a copy yeah. boy. Uh, yeah. What did you want to do? What did you want to do at the Post or anywhere else in the field once you got your foot in the door? 
really didn't have a clue. Just wanted to hang on. I, I broke in with a lot of guys who were and gals who were Columbia Law uh, Columbia Journalism School grads. So I felt kind of uh, out of place and uh, under equipped. And uh, I didn't know I didn't know what I was going to do. I just knew I had to show up at a certain time. And I figured as long as I was just there, just hustle. You know, work hard, work hard, work hard. Um, try to distinguish yourself. Uh, by outworking the uh, your your competition, and um, I guess it worked. I, I I knew I wanted to get into sports. I broke in on news side, and I I, I kind of learned the pulse of the newspaper business. And, and Brian, that's changed so radically. Since you know, this, I I dealt with hot type, and running a copy out to the out to the composing room and ripping out the front page on deadline. It was all type. I mean, there was no computers. I, I worked with the, the closest thing to a computer were pneumatic tubes that, that vacuumed the headlines out to the composing room. They were handed to me. I put them in a tube. I pressed a button. And uh, things have changed very, very radically and, and very quickly. But um, I always loved the pulse of, of a newspaper. Uh, that You know, one second it's, it's kind of there's a lull, and the next second everyone's frantic and, and cursing at one another and getting the, the product out. And uh, I kind of like that energy. And uh, then I finally got into sports as a clerk. Uh, nothing more than, a, again, I was a copy boy in sports. And my big break came when I lied and said I knew something about soccer. Uh, do you remember the New York Cosmos? Uh, I've heard of them. There's been a lot of discussion okay. of them being advertised on uh, on WFAN. Is that correct? Or is that the Galaxy? Something, uh, I don't know. Well, this was a, the original North American oh, soccer. The original one, New York okay. Cosmos with Pelé and Franz Beckenbauer uh, and Giorgio Kigali and... Uh, Carlos, uh, uh, I can't think of his name. He's a great Brazilian uh, stopper. Uh, and uh, Dennis Stewart, a fabulous uh, uh, international team. And, and they brought uh, the team was owned by Warner Electric Atlanta, essentially uh, uh, Warner Communications. And it was surrounded by the stars and Studio 54 and all this crazy stuff. And I got that beat. And I got that beat because uh, a guy named Joe Marcus passed away, very young, and he was covering soccer. And soccer really wasn't a beat. And uh, who here knows soccer? I lied. I said, yeah, oh, well, I do. He said, are right, you go cover the weekend game at uh, Giant Stadium? And uh, that was due to the Cosmos began to draw 50, 60, then 70,000 people. And the next thing I knew it was my beat. And... Uh, and I haven't returned as a copy boy since. There you uh, go. Except around my own, except around my own home, of course. <laughs> Today is, tonight's garbage night, for example. Yes, yeah, same here. Um, yeah, okay. You, uh, so, I mean, speaking of changes in the industry, I mean, in industries, you've written recently about pitching itineraries, or what you call the nonsense book. The question yeah. that will gnaw at Met fans all throughout this cold winter is, should Matt Harvey have gone out for the ninth inning in that game five, or should have Terry <laughs> Collins stuck to his agenda? To me, you know that 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 was one of those aberrational things, a once in a lifetime moment. It had nothing to do with the book. It had to do with a guy. You know, had it turned out, had it turned out well. I mean, it would be legendary right now, right? Right. So that, that that doesn't really bother me as much as the entire season spent with Collins, and not just Collins, Brian. Certainly not every manager. I can't think of one manager that doesn't. Maybe Madden. Joe Madden goes against the book now and then, but to have these these preconceived, prefabricated uh, itineraries as to when your pitcher is going to pitch, all right, you just give me five, and I'm going to go with you in the six, you in the seven, you eight, nine, each get an inning. I mean, that what 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 now seems de rigueur would, would have once been. What are they doing? You know, you don't fix what ain't broken. You don't take out. I, I kept mentioning Addison Reed during the the, the uh, World Series. He was he was spotless until that that last game, but he was spotless. But but Collins couldn't wait to take him out. Four straight postseason appearances, he went three up, three down. And Collins said, "Okay, you did my seventh inning. Now I got to bring someone in for the eighth. Why? Well, it's it's his job to pitch the eighth. Well, why can't I keep pitching? I'm, I I just threw nine pitches and I got everyone out." And that's the stuff that drove me crazy. Not so much that last game. That last game was, you know, I, I I think there was an element of Matt Harvey trying to un 
do his Scott Boris reputation. I agree. And his, that he, he, he felt compelled to do what he normally wouldn't have done to show the world. And it backfired. Yeah, I, it backfired. But, but I, you know, it, a month ago or six weeks ago, you know, Matt Harvey was supposed to have been shut down by now. I love that expression. We're going to shut you down. And and I, I think there was some element, uh, I don't know how, how, how we gauge it, but I think there was some element of, I've got to do this for my own reputation. I, I let my reputation go south, and now I've got to elevate it again. And, uh, I you know, it was, it was uh, bravado, and it backfired. But had it worked, had it worked, we'd go with that. Hey, what a guy. That guy sure showed us, didn't he? Oh, if if it had worked, it would have been Terry Collins has faith in his players, and Matt Harvey is just a bulldog oh. competitor. Right. Uh, besides the regulars breaking down the game in the booth, there was a new voice. Well, not just Pete Rose, but there was a new voice in the Fox oh. Studios, that being Mr. Yeah. Alex Rodriguez. Right. Uh, what did you think of? He was of- terrific. He was terrific. He was terrific. He made, he made succinct and common sense the whole time. What I thought of that was that that, that was a pleasant surprise to Fox because obviously these these networks don't know what they're hiring. The guy come they're hiring the biggest name for better or worse, and now more worse than better. They hired a very controversial guy, a guy who a year ago they wanted him to be out of baseball completely as a dishonorable wretch, and uh, he was terrific. But that's the charm of a, of a of a dog and pony guy. Um, he could charm the pants off anyone. I, mean, I wrote, you know, during the series that this is the same guy who, during a Yankee playoff game, was having baseballs passed out of the dugout into the stands, uh, in, in seeking some uh, female companionship after the game. You think uh, uh, the same guy is being sued by his own family for <laughs> for holding them up in the uh, whole steroid issue? There's a guy who's, who who accused the people of writing the truth as being no good liars. And it turned out that he was a no good liar. So was he terrific? Yeah. Yeah, he was terrific. But did he, was he there for the right reasons? No. Um, was it a surprise? I think, I think it was more to Fox than to us. I mean, <laughs> who was the other guy in there? Pete Rose. What yeah, was he there for? It was, it was quite was the, he was uh... an honorable guy or because he made a, Hey, look who we got. We got Pete Rose. But, you know, Fox also hired Randy Moss. Was, what was Randy Moss doing there? They, did they like the fact that he was a great receiver? Yeah, it was incident. They liked the fact that he was considered one of the most selfish, loudmouth guys ever to play. You think? But uh, that's look, look up and down ESPN's roster. We're, we're going we're to get into ESPN. I just okay. Wanna, we definitely will. I want to. Uh, I want to ask this one question. Do you think? I mean, A. Rod has sort of uh, you know this rebirth that he's had this year. He's Mr. Nice Guy. You think, yeah. Do you think he's paid his penance with fans and the game of baseball to be fully accepted, or do you think that's uh, just a New York thing? I would just, I, I would just advise to know that there's some dog and pony in the dog and pony. Right. That he, he's he's a slick he's a slick character. He's a slick, I mean, I've known so many famous athletes who people think are the most charming guys in the world. Elite Trevino. Oh, everybody thinks. Once that TV camera's off and those lights are off, he's not a pleasant guy. He just knows when to when to act like a charming guy and when it's not necessary. Uh, and um, I th- I thought he, he he did a good job, Rodriguez, given that he ha- had the job. But I don't think he had the job for the right reasons. No, but he did a good job. You're absolutely right. Uh, Speaking of controversial uh, talking heads, so to speak, uh, Kurt Schilling outraged many a few months ago with a Facebook post comparing Muslim extremists to Nazis. Now you, I don't know how many people he outraged. I think, well, he outraged I his mean, employee. Um, I don't even know what – I think his, his employees felt that they had to be outraged because there was something in there about Muslims that didn't reflect well on Muslims, but that's not what he wrote. Right. I think that Kurt Schilling is another bad hire. Another ESPN guy who doesn't shut the heck up. Another guy who makes your ears bleed. Uh, and ESPN put him in, in as their number one uh, baseball uh, analyst. And they knew there was they had hired a loser. He's not popular as an analyst. And when they saw an opening, 
Well, look, he said something that could be perceived as defamatory toward Muslims or toward people who know right from wrong. So they were happy to jump on it. As I wrote the other day, you know, Colin Cowherd made a bigoted comment, and they were they fired him on the on on the quick, but he was already gone. So they could they could stand up and say, "Look at us, we took care of this guy, huh?" Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, a fool like Stephen A. Smith can go popping off about anything, and they're gonna they're gonna sustain him. But I think that in Schilling's case, what he wrote, what he tweeted, I don't know exactly how he went about it, but. It's historically correct. He compared radical Muslims, extreme Islam, to World War II Nazism. And I don't think there's any, there's any doubt about it. It's about a master race committing genocide based on their own ideology. And um, I, I think it was, in my opinion, it was historically accurate. And then ESPN said, well, their response was, well, this doesn't reflect out the company's perspective. Well, well, what is the perspective? <laughs> <laughs> you support extreme Islam? It has nothing to do with Nazism. It doesn't, it doesn't compare. It, it doesn't equate. And then <laughs> it was just, it was, it was an, I, you know, I thought they used it as, a, as an out. Right. Right? In other words, if Schilling's back this year, it'll be as a cafeteria worker. <laughs> Let's get a little more in depth with ESPN. Uh, they appear to have entered into some, you know, unholy alliance with the NFL, and it's not a secret. It it seems like, uh, you know, the Bill Simmonses of the world who dare talk negatively about the NFL are dismissed. Yet Chris Carter can tell NFL rookies while they're out gall- gallivanting that they should have a fall guy. I mean, how do you make sense of the nonsensical? Well, I think every network. Is, is for better or worse, for better or worse, is frightened, uh, senseless out of over being accused of being an anti-black racist, and I, I uh, in 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 a in a good way as it relates to equality, but you don't you don't foment equality with inequality. You have to have the same standards to think that. One group of people can't adhere to very simple standards, and therefore we have to cut them a break. That's insulting. That's insulting to that group. But I think that, that ESPN is always frightened. I, I, I know it empirically. I've had a conversation with a top ESPN executive, and I said, well, what? that guy's so bad. Why do you, well, yeah, we don't want to be called. Well, that's just ridiculous. You, you, what you're saying is you... You you can hire an African American who's good rather than just an Amer- African American who happens to be bad. <laughs> it's absurd. Mm-hmm. But but believe me, that's not peculiar to ESPN. ESPN, you know, ESPN's an easy target. It's got so many platforms. It's a it, it's a absolutely it's an octopus. And um, but this, there still seems to be a sense that it's a paradise lost or a paradise self destroyed what it could have been, what the ESPYs could have really been. And I, I wrote that, you know, it could have been a real genuine so Instead, it's a fashion show. No, it it's totally a, is. It's a lot of dirty little jokes. It's, it's look who we got. I mean, it, they become, they, ESPN's a good example of a network that's, that eats itself from the inside out. It devours itself starting from the inside, and then it works its way out. Um, even the even the omnipotent young male demographic that it, it so obviously targets sees right through this stuff. You I mean, you, no, you I, think, I understand completely. You think you think a, a thirty a thirty year old sports fan and a sixty year old sports fan have a different opinion of Chris Berman? No, they both think he's a clown. <laughs> uh, you're you're right, and the uh, the NFL. Uh, you know, they, they sometimes, because they are so powerful, can push around the ESPNs or the Foxes of the world. and Which is, hey, Brian, you're right. And let me tell you, here's the folly of that. And then this goes on every network. If you don't think that, that MLB's, uh, that, 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 that Fox and TBS broadcast to please the commissioners of, of baseball and, and, and on and on and on, 
here's the folly of it all. For one nickel more, one nickel more in the next go around of rights negotiations, you lose it. So what difference does it make if you're honest about the sport? What difference does it make if, if you if you if you reveal something about a commissioner? Remember, the commissioner is just a just a, a puppet of team owners. The team owners, in the end, are going to vote for the for the network that has the extra nickel. I mean, do you think ESPN's rights are renewed, or ESPN buys rights to a, a league or a college conference because of the great regard? A, a, a league or a conference has for the quality of its programming? Hell no, they wouldn't know good from bad. But one extra nickel. So for an extra nickel, what are they going to stop doing? If, if, if say, a Bill Simmons was, were allowed his, his, uh, his voice, his unfettered, independent voice about Roger Goodell, what, what, what difference would it You think the NFL is going to stop cashing their checks? It's, it's... That's the folly of it. Along with the NFL, and I mean, you, you talk about... Oh, well, one other thing, if I can interrupt myself. Go for it. <laughs> Don't you think there'd be a network at this time, at this point, that would want to distinguish itself as different? We're the one that doesn't BS you. We are the one that we stand out over. We don't do it the same way. We go... We, 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 you're going to watch anyway because we have the rights to this game, but we're not going to sit here and tell you... Oh, that Pac-Man Jones boy, he sure turned his life around. What is it? It's Pac-Man Jones. He's lucky he's got football. He'd probably be in prison. I think everyone just goes with the status quo just because, like you said, it is about that extra nickel. Uh, I think it's too edgy to be different. They're afraid of a shadow. They're afraid of a thought rather than than a reality. And the reality is that an extra nickel takes it away. Speaking of nickels, speaking of honesty and commissioners in sports, along with the NFL, uh, the other major sports have quickly jumped in bed with daily fantasy sports, i.e. gambling. Right. Uh, but many- gambling? It's gambling? I, who knew? Oh, uh, many... Uh, <laughs> commissioners say it's not. It's a game of skill. Commissioners say it's not gambling. And, 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 and beer has no alcohol, and, and lard has no fat. They don't consider it gambling. What do you think it's going to take for league commissioners to finally step up and admit what it is? Well, it's too late. They, they're in. What's the old English expression? In for a penny, in for a pound? They're in. It's too late. They put their money in this. You, and the money in this case means we want our sports fans, we want our, our audiences, our best customers, our fans, to bet as often as they can, as much as they can, so they can lose their money betting on our sports, betting on our players, so we can increase our profit margin. Because after all, we're now in with the house. We're in the bookmaking business now, too, with, with FanDuel and, and DraftKings. So, <laughs> but who's going to say that? Right. I, I don't have an issue with FanDuel or DraftKings, but I do have an issue... I, well, I don't, I, my main issue is the fact that these leagues just aren't acknowledging what it is. I mean, they're playing the public. They don't care stupid. what it is. They're, they're playing the public as if we're stupid. Well, they're stupid, too. They didn't know. Look at the MLBs when there was this, this whole hint of this insider trading thing with the $350,000 bet by, I don't know, but the DraftKings got kept the inside operator right. with, a, with a fan duels. I don't know how the, 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 the logistics of it. But... <laughs> Their MLB's response is, we had no idea that guys on the inside could bet. Well, <laughs> there, it, once you're, you're selling your name to this stuff, you go, you're in for millions, and nobody asked. It's an unregulated, unsecured business. It falls under some mystical gray matter that doesn't fall within any kind of legal code. And we never asked. Why didn't they ask? Maybe because it's not because they didn't want to know. Uh, I don't still think they cared. It's hot. It makes money. Give us our take. That's that's pretty accurate. Uh, on the subject of fans blowing their money, every year the common man is priced out a little bit more from their favorite team, going to see them every every you know every home game, which you've documented numerous times throughout your career. Uh, with PSLs, luxury boxes becoming the norm. 
What's going to happen to the average fan? I think the average fan isn't really. <laughs> I'll tell you what, they're not sitting at the backstop at Yankee games. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, the 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 the, 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 the elite fan isn't sitting there. Uh, I think it all reaches a point of uh, of no return. The problem with the point of no return is that you, what, what, the, what the PSLs did, what Yankee and Met pricing has done, to a certain extent what Jimmy Dolan's done at the Garden, is the last thing you want to do. Anyone in marketing is you never want to teach your best customers how to live without you. And if my if my email and my written letters or any indicate any reflection of of what's going on, they've done just that. They've uh, people used to buy, you know, season uh, uh, subscriptions are now buying six games. People used to go to six games and now go to one game. I mean, I grew up decidedly middle class. My dad would take me to three, four ball games a year. Uh, he wasn't a stupid man. He we wouldn't go today. I know it. I know it. He, <laughs> are you kidding me? Right. Well, if he ever came back, if he ever, Brian, do me a favor. If my father ever comes back to life, <laughs> do me a favor. Yep. Don't tell him we buy water. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. I can understand. He'll kill me. Yeah. I mean, that He'll idea to me. someone from the you know generations <laughs> before is is so absurd and, and insane. Right. Uh, so do you, what do you think? Do you think the commonplace, you know, Joe Lunchpail is going to have to go to maybe a more wholesome family-themed organization that, that cares about them, like maybe the WWE? Uh, they care about, yes, they care. They care about families, all right. The, the Manson family, the Adams family. <laughs> uh, so uh, you've been a longtime critic of uh, WWE. And well, I'm not a critic. I just look at it. What happened to that superstar? Everybody, oh, he's dead. Right. What do you mean he's dead? Oh, they found him in his hotel room, drug overdose. Really? What happened to that guy? Oh, he's dead. What happened to him? Uh, he committed suicide. Right. What happened to him? Uh, they found him in, in his hotel room. He's dead. How old was he? 34. But he was a big superstar. Everyone had a poster of him. Uh, he's dead. So what was the... Who, who's in charge here? What, what's the guy in charge doing? Uh, he's hiring the next guy who's going to be dead. What's the, what's the one thing that sort of caught your eye with the WWE that sort of you know that created a feud between you and Vince McMahon? I don't have a few with him. I just well, at a certain point I there think was. He, I think he runs. I think he ru- runs a, 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 a system, systemic industrial death mill. That's all. Let him sue me. He's already sued me. He didn't get very far. But he, you know, he took up eighteen months of my life. But what's the the one thing is? Gee, I, in the late eighties, I read a little piece in the New York Times about Hulk Hogan being dismissed from testifying in the federal drug trial of a Dr. George Zahorian, who is the WWF's, uh, back then it was WWF, uh, their, their lead doctor and supplier to people such as Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon, steroids, painkillers, all this illegal stuff. And I, as I'm standing here, right above me is an attic filled with uh, the FedEx records of those deliveries. And um, when I wrote... <laughs> How can the judge dismiss him from testifying because it could ruin his career and reputation? I wrote, when his career and reputation is built, say your prayers, kids, and take your vitamins, it's built on steroids, built on illegal drug use. Now, those aren't real muscles. And I wrote that, and this is, this is before voicemail, Brian. This is before email. I would get to my office. Back then, I'd go in maybe twice a week, and in my mailbox was a stack of, call back this guy, call back that guy. People I'd heard of, from, I'm not a big wrestling fan, but people I'd heard of in the industry, and the, the message was, you don't know the half of it. You don't know. They had never seen anyone write anything critical. See, the WWE and the WWF then still sits in the same place. It's not entertainment. It's not sports. There's no one covering it on the legit. There are a few guys, but they don't have the resources to really make noise. So McMahon's a very sharp guy. He's, I, don't, I think he's an evil guy, but he's a sharp guy. 
he's got it right where he wants it. I don't want any inspection of my product. I don't want. I don't need. I don't need the media. I don't need a beat writer. You know. So what I did was, I wrote something that was. Wait a second. There's all these drugs, and and, and the, the journalist in me said, I, I can't drop this. I I'm, I didn't get into this business to cover pro wrestling, but the stories I started getting, and they they came from. Arizona, and they came from Texas, and they came from Great Britain, and they came from Canada, and they came from here, all over, and they all had the same ending, that this place is just a one, one sick son of a gun place, and the whole industry is loaded with pedophiles and uh, sexual deviants and drugs and mysterious deaths. I mean, this see the Jimmy Snooker thing. Right. Took 32 years to get an indictment. What's but, uh, and, what's going through your mind when you see Vince McMahon take time out of his show? Uh, I, I don't have the year, actually. What goes through my mind when I see Donald Trump praising him as a great guy? <laughs> He's running for president. Yeah. What goes through my mind when I see Linda McMahon running for Congress as a Republican, as a family values person? And you see, uh, you read a piece about the WWE is doing anti-bullying messages. The WWE. Really, Quite a contradiction. Really, that's like the, you know, uh, Roger Goodell telling me the sports dra- uh, draft kings isn't gambling. Of course, they're doing anti-bullying messages. Uh, what, what, what entertainment, uh, uh, sports slash entertainment, whatever it is, uh, industry is, is more built on bullying than that stuff. Uh, it was like Quentin Tarantino, those murderous cops. You ever see a Tarantino movie? It's just blood. <laughs> it's just blood on top of blood on top of blood. Stop the violence! <laughs> so another institution you've taken aim at uh, in the past is the WFAN Sports Radio in New York. And one of your frequent targets is, of course, Mike Francesa. Yeah. People may not realize you two were once actually very close. Um I wouldn't say very close, but I, I'd say that it, we were close enough for him to use me. Okay, so I, what my, my question was going to be, how did that friendship come to an end? <laughs> well, I advocated when he was first working. He, he used to work at CBS as a, as a researcher for the uh, sports department, the Ted Shaker, Brent Musburger years, and Jimmy the Greek years. And uh, when he got a weekend show on, on uh, FAN – Compared to their other hosts, who were you know well-known guys, like you know guys like Jim Lampley, but they didn't really know anything. And at least Francesa knew the difference. Between, he knew that like a left offensive tackle would guard the blind side of a quarterback, a right-handed quarterback, and that's a that's your, your most important, you know, stuff like that. And, and I wrote, this guy should get his own show. <laughs> I also supported Chris Russo. I said he's a yeller and a screamer, but he's a provocateur, and he 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 incites conversation, and maybe he'd be good too. He was working on WMCA, buying his own time. Remember WMCA down on what was it five seventy right. on the AM dial? He was buying his own time on Saturdays, and sending me tapes, begging me to write about him, and uh, so. But finally, I, you know, enough was enough with Francis. He used to leak information to me about himself. You know, they they want me to be on this show on CBS. I'd say, really? Now, I'd write it. Well, he called me so I could write it. Now, I don't need two sources on that. I spoke to the guy I'm writing about, right? Well, I'd write it, and then someone would call and say, I saw in the paper that... He said, oh, I, I, that's not true. I was... Uh, Whoa, 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 wait a second, Mike. You're going to leak something to me and be asked about it. At least come up with no comment. Don't don't tell people that I made it up. Don't mess with my integrity. And he said, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. I shouldn't do that, I shouldn't do that. And then he did it again, and I said, that's it. <laughs> He's done. Right. This guy doesn't care about anyone but himself. Um. You, you sort of answered it a little bit, but, but I'll, I'll ask here. In your opinion, what do you, you think has kept Francesa on the air for so many years? First thing is a lack of competition. There's been, there's, who's, who's, they've never had any good competition there. 
Um, he's he's a habit. He's a habit. I also think um, that train wrecks draw crowds. You know, I listen to him. I can't listen to him for long because I begin to get nauseous. When I mean, the big story from Game Five of the World Series on Monday. I only listened for three minutes, and then another three minutes. Is he kept, well, the big story was he was at it That's in my usual VIP seat. I mean, he says stuff, even if it's true, that you and I wouldn't have the nerve to say in public. Right. We'd barely have the nerve to think. I mean, my favorite, my favorite Francesca story is a bit, it's a bit subtle. He was speaking with the owner of the uh, Tampa Bay Rays and uh, about their attendance problems. And he says, you know, and he, he, he wanted to say his mother lives in Tampa, in that area. And he came out very naturally. He said, you know, I built my mother a house in Tampa. <laughs> he even used his mother, using his mother to, to anoint himself. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I just think that's hysterical. I, I love I love Mike, but he uh, today I mean you do I I do I I like Mike. He but... spit on you before he'd shake your hand. How could you love him? Well, here's the thing. Uh, I mean I I I understand. I put it He's this way. He's dishonest. I tell people I like him, people. but I understand. He lies. He bullies people. He steals people's stuff out of the newspapers. Then when it backfires, he doesn't give you anybody any credit. But it backfires. He says, "Well, I got it from that guy." But you never gave that guy credit to begin with. You stole the stuff. You know, you're an accessory to the crime. Now it's the other guy committed the crime, and you caught him. But I, yeah, also, but I also understand... You never want to be in a foxhole with that guy. But I also understand how people don't like him. We'll put it that way. Uh, I can't understand how people like him. I can't understand how anyone would stay on the line. You see, if I had a show like that, by now, you couldn't say, thanks for taking my call. No, I, I never... You know, there's a there's a there's a certain uh, dance you have to dance to get on it to be on a show. It's Mike. I, I thanks for taking my call. That's one. Two. I really love the show. And three. Please don't hang up on me. Let me finish my point. Which means a. Thanks for taking my call means I finally got through, which is stupid. Two. I really love the show. That means I recognize <laughs> I don't really love the show because three, don't step all, give me a chance to say something before you interrupt and, and ridicule me. So that three, that wipes out the first two. Right. It, you'd never have to say that to me. Not that I'm, I'm, I'm advocating a show for myself. <laughs> I, you'd never have to say, please let me, give, please give me a chance to make my point. There's there's no doubt he's a different breed, and I mean I think part of his appeal is the arrogance. Uh, it, I, I agree. It is. I, agree. I mean that that makes people. I think some people listen. Sometimes I do. I don't listen to freak show. for the hard hitting analysis. I listen to the comedy that is involved with the arrogance. <laughs> um, do you think? You're right. Yeah, exactly. Do you think Mike and the Mad Dog? I mean, they they broke up, and that the PR message that was radiated was it was a mutual breakup. Do you buy that? Do you have Do you have any? Do you think there are underlying factors? Money. Mel Carmazin was in charge of uh, Sirius XM. He asked, uh, who's the biggest uh, sports radio voice out there who's available? They said, uh, Chris Russo. Gave him $3 million a year. And Chris Russo left FAN for $3 million a year. I understand it. Of course, Chris quickly became uh, Chris from New Canaan. But uh, I, 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 they didn't like each other. Right, they right. didn't like each other. But Mike's own producers, he pays, he's, his show, that, the, the producers get the most money on that show. They, they have, they, you know, they, but they, he's lost two, I think it's two now, I'm pretty sure it's two. They just quit. They just quit on They couldn't take the abuse. Mike's producers get more money. You, you see, we can sit back and laugh. We can sit back and laugh and say, it's comical, it's comical. But if, if, if you're on the uh, side of his professional abuse, it ain't funny. It ain't funny. And all those TV shows he's worked on, it's like Olbermann. They can't wait. It's got nothing to do with personal politics. It's just how you're treated as a human being. Uh, and he treats people poorly. 
with 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 a, a convinced arrogance, with a, an imperiousness predicated on nothing. Um. Uh, so sometimes it's funny. I I get that part. It no, is I, I, in a perverse way. It's funny, but he's he's a bad guy. The demise of Mike and the Mad Dog obviously occurred in 2008, but um, it probably could have happened a lot sooner if the the lost tapes you you have written about many times were recovered. For people that don't know about... They're they're not lost. Okay, tell us a little bit more about those tapes for people that don't know. Well, uh, about, I don't know, 9-11 was a Tuesday, so I guess it's a Thursday or a Friday all I remember, it was the first day where there was some return to regulations and to standard itineraries where schools were back in. Because I remember taking my daughter played high school tennis, and I remember driving to her match, listening to... Uh, it was the first time they had a match since 9-11, and I was listening on the radio. And you got to understand something. I'm a, I'm a third-generation American. I have a... I mean, I don't have to defend my, my Judaism as a matter of patriotism, but I'm a third-generation Jewish American, and uh, with with a with a great uncle who was a World War One doughboy. My father was a naval lieutenant in the, in the in World War Two, who was an amphibious landing guy, and all of a sudden, I hear Francesca talking about. How Jews are to blame? I mean, just standard stuff that you had heard here in World War One and World War Two. Jews are to blame for every the world's woes, including the 9/11 attack for supporting Israel. And Jews have to come; they have to decide who they're loyal to, the United States or Israel. And well, wait a second, because my friends, he said, my Jewish friends would fight for Israel, but not the United States could go away. Wait, and by the way, I just got back from Normandy. And I saw a lot of stars of David in, in our U.S. cemeteries and the British cemeteries. But anyway, um, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I just couldn't believe it. I was uh, I, my, my first instincts, based on how I was raised, would turn around and go beat the piss out of them. I just said a word I'm not supposed oh, to say. Oh, you can say whatever you like. I probably should have told you in the beginning. It could have been no, expletives like flying everywhere. Uh, no, I don't want to. Okay, no problem. And And I wrote it. I wrote it, and of course, uh, some stuff briefly at the fan, and FAN said, "Oh, we don't have those tapes there. We can't, we can't seem to find them." <laughs> Which is funny because by law you have to save every tape to show your uh, advertisers that you provided their their spots. And um, I also know that a uh, Susan Waldman walked into Mark Chernoff's office. She was at FAN and was livid about what he had just said. And a lot of people were, not a lot, but people I know heard it. Oh, a lot of people, a lot of readers, of course, heard it. But um, it was it was, it was, was the kind of stuff that got a guy fired. I mean, not only was it bigoted, it was just dead wrong. And it was, it was scapegoating of the highest order. And I wrote it. And they, they of course, <laughs> Francis says, oh, I was cleared by the, the Anti-Defamation League. <laughs> That's another lie. They tried to get the tapes. They said, they're not giving us the tapes. What can we do? We didn't hear it. We can't, you know. They never cleared him. <laughs> but he's, oh, I was never suspended. Of course you weren't suspended. They made believe it never happened. So that's where lost tapes come from. We lost the tapes. And they've lost a lot of tapes since. But I, I just felt that, you know, I'm... I'm not one of those Jews you can like whack around. Are there people I mean, that I would I would have I would have punched Delman Young back. <laughs> right. Um, let's see. Are are there people? I mean, you mentioned Susan Waldman, and I, I think the reason that it, you know if this did happen, a lot of people didn't hear it is because it was such a you know traumatic time in the city. I mean, have people emailed you, contacted you, and said, "I'm glad you wrote this. This is a good thing. I heard it. This was terrible." I mean, it's... Oh, of course. Okay. Um, of course. Um, right after I wrote it, I got, yeah, I heard that too. I couldn't believe I was listening to. Okay. But the, the part, the part where, where they can't find the tapes, I mean, Russo essentially has said, well, yeah, let, let's put it this way. I've written this about six times now. He says I'm lying. 
if I were to write such a, a defamatory thing, such a, a, a libelous thing about a man in, in the public eye, I, I wrote it. Sue me. So sue me. You'll get me to stop. I'll have to pay you. Sue me. Except it did happen. He did say he went on and on. It was it was a good fifteen minute rant. I almost drove off the road. It's not the last time he's caused road rage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in an age of Twitter and every other social media platform right now, where where do you think sports media goes from here? Do you see good things? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who's it, Tortorella? The first thing he did when he went when he went to Vancouver is he said, no, "No one's allowed on Twitter." Good idea. Good idea. Too much of a bad thing is a very bad thing. No, I understand it. I, I mean, sure, I just came back from Normandy, and I didn't want really anyone to know where I, things are crazy. People people do crazy things these days. It wasn't important that anyone knew I was out of the country. And yet my wife's on Facebook telling the world every day, look, we're, now we're in France, now we're in Amsterdam. You know, <laughs> I just think it's, you know, for everyone to check in on everything, it's absurd. It's absurd. And how many people write something on the quick and hit set? You know, you know what a great line? Vern Lundquist, he's a nice guy. Do you know him at all? No, I don't. He's a sweetheart. He is just such a good man. He he said, the, the four most dangerous letters in succession in America today are S-E-N-D. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I do. Kn- I know who Vern Lundquist is. I don't know him personally. I just wanted to clarify that for everybody. Okay. I know who he is. <laughs> yeah, all from CBS. He's just a, he's a very, very... He's a sweet guy. Um, a sweet guy, but that's a very sage. No, but but send. I mean, plenty of. I, you know, I just it's like too much. You know, it's enough. It's enough. I mean, and any place where people can, you know, it's the new vandalize. It's the, it's the new graffiti. It's the new vandalization. You can write anything you want on the. There's a there's a picture of me on the internet. Uh, it was it's been cut and paste pasted. Uh, I know that expression. I know what that means. Um, and I just learned how to use our toaster. That's why I'm saying it. Nice. And, it, and, and it's a picture of me. It's been off. My kids see it. It's been up about seven years. So it's cut and pasted. And it's on. So, you know, if somebody wants to drop in a photo. If they're writing something about me or something I wrote, it's great. Except it's not me. <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> I don't do anything about it. I, it's laughable. Because what difference does it make what I look like? <laughs> it's... It's not me, though. And I've, I've been, you know, people say, you know, the guy, the guy it must, who it is must be told he's me. I mean, it's just not me, but it's okay. It's on the Internet, and that's me on the Internet, so it's me. Uh, I want to thank Phil Mushnick for coming on today um, on here. I really appreciate coming on the podcast. But before you leave, I have three questions for you to play uh, us You had, like, some luggage or some... The take-home version. Of uh, well, I mean, I, I'll send you some parting gifts if you if you want, maybe a gift certificate to a steakhouse or something like that, or a beautiful <laughs> right. watch. Um, <laughs> let's see here. I have been told that you are a big fan of the television program The Simpsons. Oh, huge fan, yeah. Who is your favorite Simpsons character? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'm going to go with... Uh, uh, well, we named our dog. We just lost him 18 and a half years. We named him Monty after Montgomery Burns. So I'm going to go with Monty Burns. Okay. <laughs> I have to go with Monty. I love that show. It, 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 I also worship at the, the, the altar of the Simpsons. Um, right, so. Do you have a favorite column you've written over the years? My expense report? Your expense report. <laughs> Once a week, it's my favorite column. Nah. Um... I've got, yes, and I couldn't think of anything. I'm, I still haven't written it. Let's put it that way. Got it. Fair good answer. And you are on Twitter. But you have no, not, I wasn't. But you are on Twitter through the New York Post, correct? No. Now, well, I'll tell you this. You go to. Oh, your, there's a guy who's. My name's on Twitter. There's a Twitter account with Phil Mushnick something. Da, 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 and it's just, it's not me. Will you ever? I never had a Twitter account in my life. Will you ever go on Twitter? I don't know. 
Ken, I just learned how to use the toaster. <laughs> one thing at a time, right? Yeah, one thing at a time. Phil, I'm not bad. I'm just weak. No, you're you're great. I appreciate again. I appreciate you coming on, ladies and gentlemen. He's Phil Mushnick. Uh, a sports media columnist of the New York Post. You can read his column, Equal Time, which is published on Sundays, Mondays, and Fridays. Phil, thank you for coming on the Red Ticket Blues thank podcast. Thank you, Brian. I enjoyed it. Hope your audience did. Well, there you have it. That's Phil Mushnick. It was a very entertaining podcast, to say the least. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, Mr. Mushnick has lots of opinions, and he has no problem uh, letting loose with those opinions. So you heard it all right there. Um I really want to give special thanks to my wife who helps me with, uh, she is my content manager for a lot of these interviews. The interviews sound very good because of her help. So I do want to really acknowledge her because she really does play an integral part of this. Uh, you can always listen to the show on iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, YouTube, and always follow me on Twitter at BrianBuck13 and follow the show at Red Ticket Blues. I uh, hope to hear, uh, if, you, if you like what you heard, you can check out a lot of the other podcasts, including interviews uh, with people, author Jeff Perlman, Neil Best, and a cast of thousands. Not really. But with all that being said, I'm out of here.